I think the Fed sees, you know, what's coming, this cascade, as I call it, of one default begets another default begets another. And, and you know, particularly commercial real estate, but I think corporate, uh, you know, debt as well, probably a lot of other sectors. Keith Weiner, how's it going, man? Andy, how are you? I'm doing really good. Uh, whenever I, uh, well, this is only the second time I've had you on, but you were on a different part of the world speaking or something. You're always traveling out on the road. I guess you're a wanted man, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, or something. If there's something, right. Wanted, thank you for coming on. I wanted to have you on here. A lot of printing going on in the world. Um, two weeks ago, the, the Fed, Fed cut 50 basis points about two weeks ago. And it seems like there's a lot of liquidity starting to really hit the fan here and slosh around in the markets. What your reaction to this and uh, how is this going to be playing out? I like that analogy of the liquidity hitting the fan. Um, <laughs> analogy I've used uh, for, for many, many years is um, credit effluent that they pump out at, at high pressure. And uh, yeah, that's correct. Right connotations to it um you know i i i, would, I take a different view of this and i, I think kind of a, a longer view than most people and it's not about the latest jobs report for me um or you know in predictions or indicators of recession quote unquote which which is all downstream of credit and i look at credit and i look at um the long-term chart of uh, interest rates which is, was in a falling trend from 1981 until COVID. And then um, the Fed first massively, you know, stimulated along with the fiscal stimulus of the so-called CARES Act. I love how they name these things. It's sort of Orwellian. They call it the CARES Act and that proves that they care. <laughs> yeah. so I, should, I should get scare quotes around care. Right. Uh, they, and they did $2.8 trillion worth of caring to us. Um, and, um, you know, they drove prices of assets up to, you know, by assets, now I'm talking about fixed income assets like bonds, up to truly absurd levels. Interest rate on the 10 year, I think, was 60 BIPs or 65 basis points, something like that. Um, and then they said, whoa, 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 you know, this is too much. And, um, you know, consumer prices are rising. So now we have to hike interest rates. And, um, you know, they get their theory wrong and they get the sign backwards on their theory as to how interest rates affect consumer prices. But anyways, that's what they did. And they started hiking. And now everyone's, oh, oh, you know, look, the Fed has just taken massive losses on their portfolio. Um, and, you know, just imagine every private portfolio that has bonds in it, you know, and so on. But the problem is this. Um, if you have a long-term trend in interest rates, whether it's up or down, that is absolutely lethal because it creates, first of all, a ratchet effect and there's an ongoing destruction and each tick, whether it's upwards or downwards in the trend, drives further destruction, which then drives, creates additional force for the interest rate to keep going in that direction. So we've had a downward trend, you know, for, for over 40 years that everyone thinks was over when the Fed said they're hiking. And I, I, I feel like the lone voice is saying, hey, hey, guys, whether the Fed thinks they're going to hike or not, they're not bigger than the market. They're not bigger than this dynamic that they've established. And the trend is going to reassert itself with a vengeance. Can't tell, can't tell you when, but um, if they try to hike, they're going to cause a great crisis. And the reason is, you know, fairly simple, but in a way not simple. And so if, if you think about from the perspective of business managers, each downtick in the interest rate is an additional increase in the incentive to borrow. Now, if you're borrowing for business purposes, you're not going on a binge of consumption. You're building more capacity. Let's say you're the manager of a hamburger restaurant, but the same, the same logic applies if you're the manager of a manufacturer of hamburger grill equipment for hamburger restaurants or plate glass windows or porcelain tiles for hamburger restaurant floors or drives their equipment or anything else. Um, every time the rate ticks down, then the cost of financing that increase in production drops. And so if you have a, a spreadsheet get it back to the hamburger restaurant. Let's say you have 57 stores in your chain. You always have a spreadsheet in your back pocket for the marginal 
store. That's the one you haven't opened yet. And if demand ticks up or the cost of opening it ticks down, that's the one you're going to open. And then the interest rate drops. Well, suddenly then you now your spreadsheet goes from red ink to the, at the bottom to black. It makes sense. So you build it and you didn't build it in response to an increase in demand. You built it in response to an increase in the supply of credit, which means decrease in the cost of it. And you, you know, you think you're getting a profit of X because that's the, the price of hamburgers in that market at that moment. But with you and all your competitors adding more hamburger restaurant capacity, what happens to prices? Well, it gets softer. And so <laughs> what happens is, um, profit margins are pulled down until return on capital is pulled out, pulled down, excuse me, to marginally above uh, cost of capital. So as the interest rate in a free market, normally every additional borrowing would push the interest rate up and you pull the inner rate of return down. But in the case of, of a, you know, a centrally planned, uh, you know, economy, which is what this is, they, they peg the interest rate, at least at the short end of the curve. Um, and you know, through this whole dynamic, the whole thing's been falling for 40 years, which means yeah. there's been this increased incentive to borrow to add capacity for 40 years and pulling down the rate of return on capital. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you think you could, and, and it's just been going down to near zero and it had been pegged at, you know, the Fed funds rate effectively at zero, the effective cost of capital to hamburger restaurants, somewhat about that, there's always the spread. Um, you know, and that, and that was that way for a long time. And then suddenly the Fed thinks they can teleport the rate from zero to five and a half percent. Well, boom, they have just now rendered all of that, that bracket from zero to zero and five and a half submarginal. Right. Now, in addition to that, even before the Fed hikes began, something like 20% of all corporate debt out there was so-called zombie debt. Now, zombie is not a term that's coined by either the alt-right or some dank corner of the internet or zero head or something like that. That term is actually the official term of art used by the bank international settlements in Basel, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. so that's the central bankers central bank uses this term to describe a company who, you know, there's several stipulations, but basically a company whose profit is less than their interest expense. So that is they're not making enough money to service the debt. They can't mm -hmm. even pay the big, let alone amortize the debt to pay the principal. They can't even actually pay the big without borrowing more. So that only exists because of, you know, two things. One is dirt cheap interest rates, obviously, and two, a very, very permissive, forgiving, promiscuous credit market where investors are saying, take my money, please. And they literally mean take because the company literally has no prospects to repay even the interest, mm -hmm. not pay the interest in full anyway. So 20% of the corporate debt out there before the rate hikes began was zombie. Um, now I have not seen an update on this data for quite some time. Um, not that I look every day. So if someone says, oh yeah, the you know, BIS just updated it, I wouldn't be surprised, but, um, 20% before the rate hikes. And now we've just moved the, um, you know, the cost of capital massively higher, which means a whole large swathe of the economy that hadn't been zombie. Uh, at zero interest rates are now rendered zombie when, you know, fed funds rates five and a half, and then the cost to that hamburger chain might be eight or eight and a half or something like that. You know, suddenly they're zombie. They used to be right. two, now they're at eight and a half. And, um, you know, so anyways, fast forward to today, you know, the fed, and maybe this will be controversial to your, um, audience and maybe it won't be, I don't think the fed cares about either if it's alleged dual, uh, you know, mandates, which is consumer prices and jobs. I don't think they actually care. They pay lip service to it. You know, they go through the Humphrey Hawkins testimony every once in a while to, you know, go through the motions and, and, you know, play the Kabuki theater. Um, I think they care about one thing, which is the solvency of the member banks, the big crony banks. So if the big crony banks are getting into trouble, their balance sheets are eroding or there's big holes being blown in them, then the Fed, you know, takes steps. And obviously it was on 2008, they're willing to take unlimited steps, you know, the lobby dam constitution, whatever that went under the bus, you know, a century ago, decades ago, um, they'll do whatever it takes to protect, you know, the big crony banks. 
So what is the threat? So the crony banks is defaults. So if, if debtors of all sizes and stripes are getting into trouble and they're defaulting on their loans or their bonds, then um, the Fed is going to say, well, what can we do? And the first, the first you know, m medical prescription, uh, maybe I should say witch doctor prescription, um, or, or, you know, whatever kind of, whatever your favorite form of quack is, is though, you know, lower the interest rates. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is if you wait until defaults are already cascading through the economy, it's rather too late. You know, if, if I, if I'm already 90 days delinquent, I'm already in collections on my, you know, truck payment or whatever, and now the fed lowers interest rates not going to save my truck, not going to save the bank from whatever losses they're carrying on that. Um, and so then, um, you know, the fed looks like they're too little, too late. They look like they're asleep at the switch and, um, and everyone says, oh, they're incompetent. They're stupid. They're this, that, the other thing. They, they didn't give us the soft landing. So called they, they promised it's a hard landing, blah, 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 blah. So I think that the fed is much, much, much more proactive, much more aggressive, much more, um, you know, the opposite of a sleep at the switch, I guess it would be a hair trigger, uh, you know, trigger finger, um, you know, to try to jump on things. I mean, it's in time, you know, I don't know, but I think that they're absolutely forced to lower rates in order to try to avert this, you know, cascade of defaults. Just look mm -hmm. at commercial real estate, for example, massive, massive amounts of whether it's skyscrapers, whether it's office parks, <laughs> you know, commercial real estate in the office sector certainly is, um, a train wreck, those developers are deep underwater in terms of valuations. And when the cash flow goes negative, which I think it is that many of these things, they can't surface the debt. And, you know, one by one, their debt resets at much higher rates. Mm -hmm. You know, the way it works, you know, if you have a loan, for, you know, from a bank, that the, the rate might reset monthly. But if you went to the bond market, if you're a bigger developer, a major corporation, you go to the bond market and you sell a bond, it could be a three year bond or five year bond. It doesn't reset typically until you know, the maturity, and now you have to go and sell a new bond to pay off the old one. And suddenly you're now exposed to a whole new interest rate world that, you know, if you sold the bond three to five years ago, you didn't, you, you were in a zero interest rate environment. Now you're in this high interest rate environment. You can't afford those payments and, you know, lenders are not as forgiving and permissive as they were during the zero rate, you know, world. And so, you, you know, you default and, um, you know, you send the keys to the bondholders and walk away. Mm -hmm. So I think that must be going on in the commercial real estate world. Uh, there's a lot of other places where that's happening. So the Fed is trying to get ahead of that. And of course, once the losses begin in earnest, people are losing their jobs, defaults are happening, the banks have to retrench, the balance sheets are under pressure, which means credit even to good businesses is contracting. You know, people are losing their jobs, businesses are trying to cut back to save money because they have to muster up whatever cash to make payments. And suddenly you get, you know, recession, um, but downstream of this whole cascade of events, which occurred yeah. before. I don't know if that's clear or if that's too academic or, you know, yes, whatever. it is clear. And I don't mean to interrupt you, but you answered about three or four questions yeah. before in all of that, but I says, well, I'm going to ask this, I'm going to ask this, and you already answered it, but I'm going to ask them anyways, if you would. Um, so in your opinion, the fed has an itchy trigger finger. Did they pull that trigger because they see something that the banks are in trouble? That is there, is that your opinion? Banks may not be in trouble yet, but I think the fed sees, you know, what's coming this cascade, as I call it, of one default begets another default begets another and, and, you know, particularly commercial real estate, but I think corporate, uh, you know, debt as well probably a lot of other sectors. Um, yeah, I think the fed sees that, you know, way out and, you know, of course they're meeting with banking leaders, both of the big crony banks and much smaller banks, and they're listening to what the banks are seeing and the banks have a pretty good finger on the pulse of, you know, what's going on. And even if they, even if the defaults haven't overwhelmed the bank's balance sheets yet, you know, I, I think the difference between the fed today, the fed today would say, that the Fed of 2007 to 2008 was asleep at the, at the switch, but mm -hmm. they didn't even, they, they didn't react until too late. And the Fed today is resolved not to make that mistake again. And so they're going to, they're jumping on it 
you know, earlier. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily early enough. doesn't mean they're going to fix anything, but that's what I, yeah, in my opinion, yes. Okay. And then, then corporate debt, you mentioned, and again, these questions you pretty much already answered, but I want to ask them again. Corporate debt, 20% of them were zombie. And, uh, if you would, uh, the Davos world or Davos words, if you would, um, is that ratcheting up much higher now, uh, because of interest rates have been so high. And is that another reason why, okay, they're looking at the corporate, the corporate market here, uh, the corporate debt market, and we got to do something. And that's why they're starting to ratchet things down. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're... The, the definition of zombie is profits are less than interest expense, you know, basically. Good you know. definition. But the the root of it is return on capital is less than cost of capital. Yeah. And, you know, ha now, that's not a problem. I mean, if you happen to be a badly managed business in an otherwise decent economy and in a good industry, then you can change management. You can mm -hmm. think differently to get you to fix the problem. But if that's occurring across whole swathes of the economy, there's, there's no management trick. Yeah. I mean, everyone can, everyone can lay off at the margin, you know, worker productivity goes up. If you lay off the lowest quality, you know, lowest productive, lowest productivity workers, you know, and so on, but you can't really lay off your way out of this problem. The problem is that interest rates have driven down the return on capital for 40 years. You're not going to reverse that. The only way to reverse that is to reverse the very trend itself, and that is higher interest rates, one by one, the marginal businesses, instead of the hamburger restaurant building more and more stores at the margin, they're closing down more stores at the margin. So you mm -hmm. have to have more layoffs, more closures, more defaults. Yep. And every time you close a store, you reduce capacity, you reduce supply, prices can go up, right? This is the rising trend that we had from, you know, post-war to 1981. Um, and, you know, prices, uh, you know, relentlessly rising higher and, and mar margins getting fatter versus mm -hmm. margins getting compressed in the, in the falling trend. There's, there's no way to fix it other than just massive, massive, massive amounts of defaults and closures and layoffs. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Instead, they just figure, okay, well, we'll cut rates and, and hopefully avoid that. And, um, I, I think that's where we're at right now. I think more rate cuts are coming, um, and, um, you know, ultimately they're going to have to be back at zero and beyond, uh, and if they want to continue the, uh, the boom. Yeah. So that is, it has a lot of implications right there. I had, um, another guest on just somewhat anecdotal, but I had another guest on about two weeks ago and we talked about how, what we need is deflation and def deflation is highly underrated because well, a lot of things, but the bottom line, it makes everything's reset, right? At a lower price. It's really good for people like me in the middle class. Thanks. And then one of the comments was, no, you're clueless because if you have a mortgage or if you're in debt, deflation's not good. I paraphrase. And I'm like, wait a minute, because you can re-service the debt at a lower interest rate and you can refinance your house at a lower interest rate, which is all very deflationary, right? Um, anyways, but I guess my question to you now is really what's the next thing to happen, if you would, as, as rates come down, I guess, are we going to see massive deflation here or are we going to, do you expect to see inflationary monetary inflation, which is printing and deflationary pressures in the economy, if that makes sense. So I, my, my definitions are a bit different from, quite different from the, the standard. Okay. Most people define inflation as either an increase in the quantity, what they call the supply of money, right. which isn't actually supply. Like a supply of goods is an, an annual production and of course consumption matches. But in the case of money, it's a stock, not a flows. Um, that is, uh, you know, the same dollar can go over and over and over and bid product after product after product up. Um, so an increase in the quantity of what we call money, which actually isn't money, but credit. And they assume that the more or less direct and linear consequence of an increase in the quantity of dollars is an increase in the price level. 
And either of those two is called inflation, and usually interchangeably. And even Milton Friedman himself, the, the guy that would certainly make the distinction between cause increase in quantity and effect increase in prices, actually sometimes conflates the two words. Um, and deflation means, you know, falling consumer prices. And so a lot of people say, okay, well, what could be wrong with inflation? Consumer prices are going down. Isn't that good? Um, my definitions are quite different. Um, again, looking at the root of the whole thing being credit and mm -hmm. I define inflation as the counterfeiting of credit. And that is credit where the borrower has, you know, either lacks the means or, or the intent or both to repay. Um, and, um, mm. so they call it borrowing, you know, I've written all kinds of, you know, articles about this. Imagine, you know, your 12 year old kids like dad, can I borrow a thousand bucks? And you have two questions. First of all, number one, what the hell do you need a thousand bucks for? Number two, how the hell are you going to repay it? Right. And he says, oh, I'll find a way somehow. So, um, I think in one of my articles, I said, okay, so imagine you and a hundred other dads across, you know, your, your subdivision you know, I'll lend your kid a thousand bucks and then somebody comes along and gathers all of those thousand dollar loans and creates an asset backed security, gets a credit agency to give it an A rating and then sells, you know, sells it into the market as a, you know, a asset backed security of some sort. Um, the whole thing is, is completely, uh, you know, fraudulent because none of these kids have a job. None of these yeah. kids are actually capable of repaying. And, um, so deflation is the inevitable consequence and that is a forcible contraction in credit. Inflation is a fraudulent or counterfeit expansion and deflation is the forcible contraction, which isn't necessarily default. It could be a cram down. It could be debt for equity swap. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of different ways that, excuse me, a lot of different ways that credit can contract mm -hmm. and that credit impulse, if you want to call it that. When it's expanding, you know, you're getting all sorts of, in a falling interest rate environment, you're getting everything that everybody considers to be wonderful, which is rising GDP, rising asset prices, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, jobs that appear to be healthy, you know, et cetera. Um, and certainly a lot of consumption, you know, going on all fueled by this, you know, debt binge. Um, and then deflation has a great deal of pain. Sure. Consumer prices might be cheaper. And the reason is because you're jobless, you can't compete against the other consumers at the store. Mm -hmm. At least that's the theory. Now we have such a welfare state today that certainly for necessities, it's not really true that people that are rendered unemployed don't compete with other consumers. They may outcompete them because you have an EBT card and they're still trying to make their wage <laughs> stretch to, to buy that, um, you know, food or whatever. Um, so everything gets more and more distorted as government comes in and more and more different, you know, yeah. to impact the market, undermine a any kind of mechanism to let anything correct, uh, in any meaningful way. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, so is deflation good. Well, in a certain sense, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. If you have, I, I love the term, I don't like John Kenneth Galbraith. He's a Keynesian, but he coined a term called the bezel, um, which is, you know, short from embezzlement and the bezel is, I think he's talking about market prices, like the stock market and asset prices. It's that portion of the price that essentially is, is fraudulent and something wrong. And that, um, you know, deflation would be essential to collapse of the bezel. So you have this boom, the bezel is growing, growing and growing. And the bezel is the difference between the real value and, you know, the irrational exuberant um, in the market value, or if I can hijack his term and repurpose it slightly, it's the difference between, um, you know, the, the actual credit that, that sound and was lent on a sound basis and, and therefore can be repaid versus the unsound credit that's, you know, counterfeited, uh, or, or, or fraudulent in some way. And, you know, if the fed distorts the interest rate, then it becomes harder and harder to distinguish how, what credit what component of the credit is legitimate and what component of the credit was literally only borrowed because the fed made it cheaper to borrow it. And the, the, the real asset underlying that is really not, uh, strong enough to service any real debt, but if the fed manipulates the cost of it low enough, well, any Tom, Dick and Harry can borrow at zero interest rates and find something to make 0.01% return on capital and 
you know, be, be a court of a genius, then the interest rate goes up and, you know, the bezel is suddenly revealed. Um, you know, what did Warren Buffett say? When the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Yeah. Um, and so it's a necessary cleansing because all of it's unsound. All of it <laughs> ultimately, you know, the root question that I think any economic theory has to address is how do enterprises know whether they're creating or destroying wealth? Because mm -hmm. if you distort that signal and enterprises are destroying wealth at scale, your mm -hmm. society is doomed. Mm -hmm. And a falling interest rate is just an increase, ever increasing distortion, you know, to that signal, then deflation is the, you know, it, it was temporary restoration of that signal, but extremely painful. Mm -hmm. Everyone calls it austerity. Everyone hates it. You know, all the voices, you know, populist voices on both sides of the aisle come out against it. No one's going to have any tolerance for it. And that's why the system is, you know, mired down and, you know, the way it is. And there's not. Uh, there's not going to be any, any change to the system. We just go through, you know, it's like bulimia. We go through binges and purges, neither mm -hmm. of which is really healthy. Right. Well, you are either overeating or we're, we're starving ourselves to death and, and, and you know, causing ourselves to puke. Right. So where, I guess, in your opinion, where are we at in that cycle now? Are we going into uh, a deflationary contraction in the economy now, or did the Fed, uh, with all of their money printing and all the central banks money printing this flood, is he going to, uh, push that out down to the future now? That is the key question, right? Uh, supposition is that there is going to be at least a wave of purges, but some of this is baked in the cake. It's probably too late. Let's say take commercial real estate as an example, defaults are coming. Things are happening, and even if they cut interest rates, they're not going to fill up those office buildings and those office parks. Um, you know, not quick enough to matter for the current, you know, nominal owner. So, you know, it's going to change hands, lower prices. Um, you know, is the Fed more proactive than it was in 2008? Yeah, probably. But on the other hand, the, you know, the, the pressures are so much bigger. The bezel is so much larger now. The bezel. <laughs> versus, uh, um, you know, in 2008. So th therefore the pressure for it all to come collapsing down is much greater. And, um, you know, we'll see how great the emer alleged emergency measures that the Fed will have to take, you know, will be, you know, they, they, they like to talk about the hypothetical bazooka that they're going to, you know, fire whatever weapons that it takes. Um, y you know, I don't know if you remember the, you know, the first version of doom, but they had a gun called the BFG 9,000, which is yeah. much more much more lethal than a bazooka. Maybe the BFG 9,000 comes out. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. but I think, I think the economy is going to be headed for a downturn. Um, and you know, major corporations are laying off now. Um, you know, prices for things are soft. Even here, in, I'm in Dubai at the moment and things are booming here in a way that would be almost incomprehensible in the U S at the moment. And I see billboards on the side of the road advertising bar, you know, buy a car and get, um, 60 months at 0% interest. So even here, even amidst this boom, you have to incentivize the, uh, the car buyer with that much, you know, incentive. Mm -hmm. and of course, in the U S the same thing is happening, but you know, things are more sluggish there and have been for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think, I think pain is coming. How great the layoffs will be. I don't know. One of the interesting things. Uh, just to do an aside on the layoffs is that, you know, the fed was kind of like Pavlov's training the dogs that, uh, you know, all through the, the period of call it 2011 through 2020, um, you know, there would, there would be these head fakes where they're going to hike interest rates, cause a recession, whatever. And, you know, the, the name of the game, if you're a big corporate employer is when you see you know, when you see the signs of the recession coming, you want to lay off as early as possible into the downturn, like ahead of the downturn, or as the downturn is really getting underway, you save the maximum amount of money, the earlier you do it. And then once the downturn finally, and I mean, hopefully what's a sharp V, maybe it'll be a sharp V turning up. You want to be the first guy to hire, you start going for market share and hopefully your competitors are more lagged and then you get ahead of them. Every time 
corporations did layoffs through all the little head fakes that occurred during that, you know, decade period. Um, you know, the Fed punished them by, you know, more stimulus and, well, you know, we were only kidding about the interest rate hikes or whatever. And um, every corporation that did layoffs, thinking they were getting ahead of it, regretted it. Mm -hmm. They were made to eat their layoffs. And in some cases, they went to the employees that just laid off a few months prior and begging them, please come back and giving them, you know, two years of salary as a bonus or doubling their salary, all kinds of stuff to get them back. Mm -hmm. What that means is after you've done that X number of times, everyone's trained, right? And then um, now if this, is, if this is the real one, the corporations are reluctant and they hold the employees longer than they should. And then when they finally get slammed with it, then they're going to suddenly be forced, you know, it's that purge, it's that puke. Now yeah. suddenly, you know, more happens because they're, they're behind the curve. Um, and I think all of this is lining up, all these waves hit. You know, at the same time, I think, I think it's going to hit pretty hard. We'll see. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm afraid you're right. I would agree with your thesis. Um, real quick, and we'll end on this. Um, let's talk about gold really quick, man. We've had such a run here. Is this, um, again, are we in the beginning of this or, um, uh, what's your opinion of, uh, where we're at in this cycle? So, um. The Fed's kind of put itself in an interesting box. And um, I've used the term Zugzwang, which is, I think, how, how you say it in German. But it's the term used in chess. When you, you find yourself on, you, you know, the position on the board is such, you'd rather pass. There's no move that you want to make. But, of course, mm -hmm. you have to do something. And so if the Fed cuts, then, okay, the money printers are back on, and the gold price is obviously going to respond very positively to that. But if the Fed doesn't, then credit gets more and more under stress and the market is going to dump credit and look for something to buy that isn't credit. And when you look around or credit sensitive, such as real estate, when you look around and your gold is the anti-credit, you know, asset, I mean, you can buy real estate, can buy all sorts of things for real assets, but they're highly credit sensitive. They isn't credit sensitive in that way. So no matter what the Fed does, whether they allow things to get worse and worse, and you know people are going to be jumping out of equity and in debt into gold, or whether the Fed is you know, turning on the bigots again, um, you know I, I think either way gold responds favorably. Now I happen to be sitting here in the Middle East at the moment, and um, you know an observation that I've talked about a number of interviews, you know over the last six months is that. There are four worlds that are buying gold, you know, hand over fist, um, but not the Western world. In the U.S., in in the U.K., in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, people are sitting on the sidelines as the prices run up. Um, and, you know, rightly or wrongly, that's just sort of the psychology. Again, Pavlov has trained the dogs. If the gold price runs, you know, post 2011, when the price, you know, peaked. Uh, you know, over and over and over, once the price would rally, it would never last. And anybody who had bought into the rise, you know, lost money and was forced to sell at a loss. So, sitting on the sidelines. But here, you can see there's four worlds that are buying, and they're, and they're not driven by the same psychology or the same drivers. So, the Chinese are buying gold as the anti Chinese government play and the anti Yuan play. They don't trust either. They want to get their wealth out of both. And they're buying gold, and that's a massive, you know, market. Obviously, um, you have Turkey. You know, and inflation seems to be calming down at the moment there, but um, you know, for quite a while it looked like imminent hyperinflation, and even now I think it's running at thirty percent a year or something. I mean, it's completely yeah, gosh. Um, so you know, nobody can really hold the lira any any length of time, and so gold is the thing that you know they do. And, you know, if, if you wander around Turkey and talk to people, you know, the minimum amount of gold that anybody would have would be, you know, say 10 grams, which for, you know, country where wages are that much lower, that's, that's a fair bit. And the average person would have a hell of a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Um, in, um, the, uh, in India, of course, they always buy gold because the Indian rupee is always going down even against the dollar, which is going down against gold anyway. Um, mm -hmm. and then finally the Arab world. 
those three are, are anti yuan, anti lira, and anti rupee plays. By the mm -hmm. way, they're not anti dollar plays in the slightest. Mm -hmm. Of the of the four, the only one that you could argue is an anti dollar play is the Arab uh, bid on gold, um, because they have stable currencies in this part of the world that are pegged to the dollar. By the way, um, and they don't have to worry when they go to bed at night that you know the currency is going to be devalued by forty percent in the morning when they wake up. Uh, but they're buying gold. You know, they don't love, a lot of them are very pro-America, but they don't love American monetary policy uh, in, in the slightest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're getting the short end of that stick. So there's four different, you know, distinct worlds that are buying gold for, for reasons that are completely out of sync with that Western gold buyer and how, you know, how we look at charts and how we look at every word that Jay Powell says, um, you know, try to parse his, I remember with Alan Greenspan, you know, looking at the Sizer's briefcase and, and all that. And, and these people are buying gold for different drivers. and They're not paying attention to the, how fat his briefcase is. They're looking at, at a whole other, you know, set of things. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, this market has been trading for quite, for quite a while now, quite differently from that 2012 to 2019 to 2020, you, you know, call that bear market in a way. Um, it's trading very differently. And in that market, every time the price would rise, we could see it in the data that we have on our, on our website. We have 60 some odd graphs on the monetary metals website, you know, updated daily. And we could see the price would blip and the basis would rise. And the basis is the difference between the future and the spot. So if the price is going up and the spread between futures and spot is rising, you can just see the people are bidding on futures. Okay, fine. Right. They're, they're, they're speculating on it, but. If that's what's driving the price is speculation on futures, then that's a very short lived thing because, you know, futures are a short term trade and, um, you know, they're bought and then they're going to they're bought with leverage and they're going to be sold. And so they were front running themselves and the imagine rise that never came. This market's not trading that way. Now this market, when the price is going up, the basis isn't necessarily rising or it's even falling in some cases. So we have a model that, um, well. I always have to, to give the caveat. Um, uh, there was a guy named Box who said, all models are wrong, some models are useful. So that said, we have a model that um, you know calculates what we call the fundamental price for gold and for silver. And the fundamental price is the hypothetical construct of what if we backed out the actions of the speculators in the futures market, where's the mutual buoyancy? So sometimes the you know, picture of two posts and there's a rubber band, or sometimes the market is, um, uh, you know, manic and pull, kind of craft it from pushing it down. You know, if we could sort of measure the tension on it and the, and the angle, you know, we, we could know that. And that's what we're trying to calculate. And um, at the moment, the fundamental price for gold is 2850. Wow. So, you know, it's not the moonshot that you people are calling for, but it is calling for continued bullish. Doesn't mean there couldn't be a correction tomorrow. It's not a timing predictor. And of course it's, you know, the, the markets are dynamic with a lot of iteration and all the different players and forces there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, turning, it could change, but, um, you know, but this has been this way for quite a while that the, the fundamentals have been a couple hundred dollars higher than the, yeah. uh, uh, than the market price, which means the market price is tending to, you know, rise. Yep. So, you know, 2012 to 2019, it was very much a sell the blips market. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to be the guy, you know, the gold price would blip 75 bucks or whatever. You didn't want to be the guy that was buying then. That was the time to sell. And then you get another buying opportunity, you know, 50 bucks below that or 75 bucks below that. This is now a buy the depths market, not a sell the blips market. Now, yeah. we've obviously blipped. Does that mean buy more? You know, maybe. Maybe not, but um, if we do get a correction, you know, that's probably the time to, to buy more if you're trading it. Uh, but I, I, I continue to be bullish about it because the monetary system has hit that point where, you know, there are more people that are jumping into gold. And it's, it's always the change at the margin that drives change yep. price. There yep. are more new people coming to gold or more existing people are increasing their gold positions because they're forces that are way, way beyond, uh, you know, Trump versus Kamala Harris and what Jay Powell's going to do and who the next Fed chairman's going to be. 
depending on who he gets elected to be president. There's a lot of people that don't, don't even pay attention to any of that. They've got mm -hmm. other problems. Yeah. That would be me. <laughs> he, um, we'll end on that. I want to thank you so much. I, can you, uh, people never heard of you. If this is the first time listener listening, how do they do business with you and how do they read more about you and read your, uh, your articles? So my company is called Monetary Metals. We pay interest on gold in gold. The website is monetary dash metals with an S dot com. Uh, and on Twitter, I'm at real Keith Wiener with K E I T H W E I N E R. Excellent. So for all my viewers and listeners out there and, um, Keith is very responsive and I'm a huge fan, Keith, of talking to you and having these uh, very in-depth discussions. And I just want to thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you.